Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Rev. Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. How's everybody doing tonight? Welcome to our... Fire it up Bible study tonight. We are excited about the Word of God. My name is Pastor Cable Brown, where I serve as the assistant pastor here at Shallow Baptist Church under the uh, arm of Reverend Dr. James A. Duncans. We appreciate you checking us out on Facebook, on YouTube, and all the other social media platforms that we're utilizing during this pandemic. We do have an exciting word for you tonight. I hope you joined me last week because we're talking about how to make better decisions. Matter of fact, the title is, Lord, help me make better decisions. I don't know about you, but I made some terrible decisions in my life, and uh, you know, I had to pay the price for them. I'm so thankful that for the grace of God that he redeemed my bad decisions. In some cases, he turned those things around and made them work for me, and I appreciate it. But I want to talk to you tonight. We, we ended up last week on seven ways we made bad decisions. I believe we went through five of them already, so I'm just gonna go briefly uh, uh, through those five, first five, and then we're gonna hammer down on the next two, and then we're gonna talk about, I wanna show you, rather, a person in the Bible who made a series of bad decisions that led to a, a, a horrific sin that led to a catastrophic situation in his family. So let's just go through it tonight, amen? So I hope you're with me. Matter of fact, let's pray before we move on. All right? Amen. Amen. Father God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for all that you're about to do. We pray that this word will find someone uh, where they are, that it will search them out. And Lord, I pray that you help them to be able to make better decisions, Lord. And I uh, humble myself before you and your people. Use this vessel to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Seven ways. We make bad decisions. The first one we said last time was that we make them too fast. Remember? We said we make them too fast. Oftentimes we don't think. We just react. And God says, wait a minute, you got to slow down sometimes. So you said this. we got to be patient and wait on God. Now remember, since this is on tape, you always go back and look at the tape You can just uh, in case you miss anything. So I'm going to move through this portion kind of quick. But the Bible says, wait on the Lord, be, a good, be strong, in the King James Version, be of good courage, and let thy heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. We have to become patient. We got to wait for God. And that's not easy, particularly when you're in a situation where you want to make a decision, and that decision is starting to press down on you. We make them too slow. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes God wants us to move. We're standing still. We're moving too slow, and God says, I need you to move. We read Proverbs 24, verses 30 to 33 last time. Amen? We talked about the slothful man, whom uh, the writer of the book of Proverbs, which was Solomon, he went by the, slothful, the, sl uh, the, sl uh, the man who was slothful, the lazy man, and he noticed how his, his grass had grew and his house was falling apart, all because he decided he didn't want to move when it was time. When you're too slow, sometimes stuff starts to grow up around you that can have taken over, and you, before you realize it, you're in a tight situation, you don't even know how you got there. Sometimes you move too slow. We make them alone. We make, sometimes we make decisions alone. We think that we have all the answers. Well, the Bible says in a multitude of the counselors, there's wisdom. We need other people who are seeking the face of God, who know how to pray, who has your best interests at heart, and they're willing to help you to tell you sometime when you're wrong. But hear what I'm saying. We need people in our lives that are willing to be courageous enough to tell us we don't always know what we're talking about and then offer us uh, uh, advice that's you, that we can use. Amen? So we, we should not make decisions by ourselves all the time. Remember, just moving through this portion. We're going to slow down a little bit. 
of Proverbs 15, 22. Without wisdom, purposes are defeated, but by many wise men, they are established. Your purposes won't come to fruition. You may have plans, but do you know all the nuances that go into what you need to do? You need someone to help you to see the grays, the blacks and the whites, help you see the ins and the outs, what consequences can come up by the decisions that you make. You need someone who has wisdom. Let me share this real quick, and I'm gonna get out of the way on this one. Don't share all your dreams, visions, and hope with somebody who isn't doing anything. Think about that. They're not doing anything. They're not going anywhere, but they want you that you want, they want you to share your dreams and hopes. Now tell me how they're gonna help you. It's like a man who you want to go buy tires for your car from, and you get information from someone who has, who's, who rides a bicycle. Does that make sense? Come on now, all right? So the next thing is when we make them as a reaction or, in, or retaliation, this is where we ended up last time. We make them as a reaction or retaliation. Someone says something, I immediately respond. Someone does something, I want to retaliate. And God says that's not the way we are supposed to handle things. Matter of fact, the word says in Proverbs 20, 22, do not say I will repay evil. Wait on Jehovah or the Lord and he will save you or deliver you. The Bible says over in Hebrews chapter 10, God says I, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, save the Lord. We should not try to retaliate against someone who has offended us. We need to leave them in the hand of God because the Bible tells us that my wrath does not work the judgment of God. So we need to let God be God. Amen? So, and then we make them out of fear. We didn't discuss this last time. We make them because we're afraid of what someone might do. We make them because we're afraid we might miss something. We make them because we're afraid we might miss out on, on, on opportunities. Well, the Bible says here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, but God has not given us a spirit of fear. Look what he says, but a power and a love and a sound. And God did not give us a spirit of timidity where we're feeling dread. That's not the spirit of God. God says I give you a spirit of self-control and love. Anything we do, before we, before we move out and launch out, if I'm fearful to do it, I have to talk to God. I have to let God di direct me. Fear cannot be the thing to direct us because once we, once we are mo motivated by fear, fear has a way of paralyzing us. Amen. So we never move forward. We never be able to go beyond where we are if we allow fear to dominate us. Amen? And then, here's the last one on the seven ways you make bad decisions. And this is a big one. This is a big one. So I need y'all, come up, come on, come closer. I need y'all to hear this, all right? Turn TV down, all right? Tell the kids to be quiet for a moment. Because this is a big one. Number seven, we make them to make other people happy. We make decisions, listen to me now, we make decisions to make other people happy. Now, Paul said it like this, Galatians 1.10, and we're going to park it here for a moment. For I am not, for am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Do I want to please man who has, has no heaven or hell to put me in, who can't bless me, can't keep me, can't save me? Do I want to please them or rather please God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were trying, still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I would not be serving Christ if I'm trying to serve man and trying to please man. Men have a way of changing on you. People have a way of agreeing with you in one, one moment and then stabbing you in the back the next. It doesn't make sense. Matter of fact, this brother right here says it better. Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell said something right here that is phenomenal. You need to hear this. This is one of the things I'm going to just keep reiterating to myself. It's, it is hard to imagine a more stupid or more dangerous way of making decisions than by putting those decisions in the hands of people who pay no price for being wrong. <laughs> I hope you got that. 
Look, I, I gotta read it again, all right? It's hard to imagine a more stupid or more dangerous way of making decisions than by putting those decisions in the hands of people who pay no price for being wrong. A person who has no vest investment, has no, 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 uh, they won't feel it, whether you up or whether you down, whether you make it, whether you don't, they go on with their life. But they want to help you make decisions and have no investment in it. No emotional ties to it. It won't hurt them if they make a bad decision. It won't hurt them if they're wrong. But it can hurt you. Because you see, you're handing your life over to somebody else to make decisions for you. And too many people right now, I'm talking to somebody, too many people right now are making decisions based on what mama said. Mama going on the glory. You still worry about what mama think. You think about what daddy used to say. And you're trying to live your life up to a standard they have set. And God says, wait a minute. I came to set you free. Matter of fact, write down Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, for freedom Christ has come to set you free. Jesus came for the purpose of setting you and I free from, from sin, for the penalty of sin, and watch this, for the need to be a people pleaser. I hope you're hearing me. Too many of us are living our life based on what other people think about us and we can't be delivered or find deliverance through freedom because we're worried about how so-and-so think about me. Don't want anybody to say anything wrong about me on Facebook or some kind of other social media. I come to the belief that it doesn't matter what people think or say because they're going to be with me one moment and against me the next. They were with Jesus one moment and then shouting the next, crucify, crucify. So if they could do that to the Savior, they certainly could do that to us. So I suggest to you, if nothing else, you get nothing else out of this class, deliver yourself from people. The Lord gave you the power, gave you his spirit, gave you his word, so you don't have to live under the dictates of somebody who don't really care about you. Amen? Now I have time to even go any further because my time is limited. But I, want, I just want you to hear that. Amen? So the definition of a bad decision. I want to talk to you real quick about the definition of a bad decision. Look at this. A bad decision is one in which you override your senses and choose an option that at some level you know you should not. A bad decision is not, listen to me, is not the result of the bad decision that makes it a bad decision because you maybe you made the decision on limited knowledge. Maybe you made the decision because you just thought it was the right thing to do. But when you know something inside you is saying, don't do it. The Bible says that every man is tempted. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, every man is tempted, right? But God gives us a way of escape. I believe one of those ways of escapes is that the Holy Spirit talks to us, tells us, don't go there. Don't go in that direction. Stop. Pump your brakes before you make another move. Stand still. Before you make a move, stop what you're doing. Think about it. Many times we override our own senses, knowing this is not something I should be involved in. I shouldn't get in the car after having a drink. I shouldn't go ahead and start uh, dealing with people who I know are, are, are crooked. Amen? I, I, should, I should stop, pump my brakes before I get involved in this relationship with this person who has told me, hasn't shown me that they're broken up with the last person. They told me, haven't shown me. Think about it. Something inside you said, I don't know, maybe I, should, maybe I shouldn't go so far. But you override those things in order to get what you want, to do what you want. And then we pay the price. There's always a price to be paid. Whenever we override our senses, override what's in us, override the Holy Spirit. When we know he tells us, stop before you go any further and we'll stand, we'll, we'll get off, you know, Busted and say, I want to do it anyway. It's like a child. I know that's how I was. I told y'all before I was grown when I was eight. I did what I wanted to do. And I paid the price. Because my dad, well, yeah, y'all know, I told y'all before, he, he knew how to walk behind. Now, I want to give you an example. I'm going to slow it down now. Of a bad decision. I want to show you an example. My man David. You know David. David, the king of Israel, the David who others have said David had killed his thousands, or Saul killed his thousands, David killed his ten thousands. He was a psalm writer. 
He's the one who loved the Lord. Amen. He wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He wrote songs like, the Lord is my high tower, my shield, my buckler. He talked about his great love he had for God. And, 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 and um, God had some words to say about him too. You see, David was known as the man after God's own heart. David. That's the one I'm talking about. David the giant slayer, the one I'm talking about. The one when everybody else was fearful, David said, who is this Philistine dog that he was standing and opposed and defy the armies of the living God? David, the one who ran out with just five smooth stones and, and a sling and took out the giant and, and cut his head off and caused the rest of Israel to stand up and, 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 and encourage and, and, and they slaughtered the uh, Philistines. That David is who I'm talking about. That David, right? But David wasn't perfect. Far from it. David wasn't perfect. Matter of fact, David had some issues. And we're going to talk. But look at God's testimony of David first. Look what he says here in uh, this is Acts. But now your kingdom will not last. The Lord has searched for a man after his own heart. This is where God decided to get rid of Saul and install his own man. David was God's selection. The people selected Saul. God selected David. Right? The Lord has appointed him a ruler of his people because you did not follow the command of the Lord. I'm sorry, that's 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13. And so because David, I mean because Saul didn't want to follow the rule of God, God says, I'll get rid of you and I'll start install my own man. This David was God's selection. David just giant slayer. David the worshiper. David the praiser, God's selection, right? What else God had to say? God removed Saul and made David their king. God spoke favorably about David. He said, I have found that David, son of Jesse, is a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. God says he will do everything that he wants. This was God's testimony about David. He's chosen him, selected him. He said, he's going to do everything I want to do. And he chases after me. He pursues me. He's a man after my own heart. Everybody hear that? That's what God said about David. But David wasn't perfect. David had a fall. We know, while we know that David loved the Lord, that's what's up here. We know David loved the Lord. But David had some problems. He had, he had faults and failures. He made bad decisions. And we're going to look at how David ended up in a predicament that ruined his whole household. I hope you're hearing me. His situation ruined his household. First, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Notice what it says. Now in the spring, at the time when kings go to war, David sent Joab. <laughs> the time when kings went to war, David sent Joab. Kings go to war. He sent Joab and his servants and all Israel with him. He sent all the warriors, all the mighty men, but David decided to stay home. And they made waste of the land, children of Ammon, and, and took up their position before Rabba and shutting it in. In other words, they had victory where they fought. They, 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 they were slain they were slaughtering the enemy. But again, David was still at Jerusalem. The time when kings went to war, David was at home. Catch, catch that real quick. Catch that real quick. All right? Catch that. Now, one evening, David got up. David was supposed to be at war. One evening, he got up. And he got up, got out of his bed, and started walking around his roof. And David... The Bible says he noticed something. He noticed this beautiful woman and he began to stare at her. Now, the scriptures say he saw her, but the word saw means he looked at her intently, meaning he spied on her. He stepped, he took and had a long gaze. It was like David was walking and all of a sudden he noticed. Wait a minute. Who is this? He started thinking 
he started looking, he's staring, he's gazing, he's spying. David was, it was taking his time to peruse the area and peruse this beautiful woman. And, and when he did that, a problem began. David began to fall into a problem. He stayed home. That was one problem. But then the next problem was that he took to, well, before I jump ahead of myself, let me read the text. Let me finish reading the text. Now, David said to get knowledge. Wait a minute. He said to get knowledge of the woman and was one, and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Notice how they responded when David inquired. They said, this is Bathsheba. They could have stopped it right there. But they said, no, that's the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah. There must be a reason that the servants told him more in depth about who this woman was. They wanted to make sure he knew who he was inquiring. That you weren't just talking about somebody who was just, she wasn't a single person. She wasn't by herself. She wasn't detached from someone. We know her daddy, and we know who her husband is. And your, her husband is somebody who's a person in your kingdom, who is a warrior in your kingdom. Think about it, David. You're going to move on. Verse 4. And David sent and took her. And she came to him, and he took her to his bed, and she had, she had been made clean. Then she went back to her house. We finished the text. And the woman became a child. And she sent to, to she sent word to David that this woman, that she was with child. Hmm. And David said to Joab, saying, Sing Uriah the Hittite to me. And Joab sent Uriah to David. The beginning of the cover up. I'm going to stop at verse 6. David had several issues. Several things to help us to understand how we can descend into sin by making faulty or bad decisions. Amen? I want to look at at least five things that David did that led him into sin. The bad decisions that led David into sin. Step one, he was not on his post. Step one, David had a responsibility. He was supposed to be where it, where was she supposed to be? At the battle. It was time when kings went to war. David was the king of Israel. They were there representing his kingdom while he stayed at home. While he should have been fighting, David was laying back and chilling. Amen. Watch this. Any time that you have a position, whether it be, whether it be at home, as a father, whether it be at home as a mother, whether it be as a minister or teacher, if you're supposed to be somewhere and you have the responsibility to be there, you need to be with, on your post. Because anytime you watch this, shirk your responsibility. The word shirk means to evade the performance of an obligation. When you evade the performance of an obligation, whether it be someone who's supposed to be on your post on your job, they expect you to be there. They need you to be there. You don't show up 10, 12 minutes late. Oh, I'm getting deep now. I'm getting personal. I know somebody's saying, you look, Pastor, get off me. No, I, we need to go here. Because I told you last week, 2021 is a, is a year of reckoning. God wants us to change. He wants us to improve. He wants us to get better. But we can't get better by making the same decisions. Amen, somebody. So the first thing David did that was wrong, he was off his post. He showed his responsibility. When you shirk your responsibility, you leave yourself vulnerable to the enemy's suggestions. Do you hear what I'm saying? You leave yourself vulnerable to the enemy's suggestions because you're not where you're supposed to be. God may you have a blessing waiting for you in a certain location at a certain time. But because you decided, I'm just going to stay home, stay in bed, I'm not going to get up, I'm not going to pray, I'm not going to read my word today. I'm too tired. I've been through too much. Oh, you don't understand, Pastor. No, that's all those are excuses, and you're missing your blessing because you don't, you're not in a position where you're supposed to be, and it leaves you open and vulnerable to what happened to David. Understand, David's not the only one that's going through this cycle where he first served his responsibility, and look at the next thing he did, though. Step two, he stayed too long. When he looked at her, he lingered too long. 
he stared, he stared, he spied, he gazed at the sheep. He took too much time looking. Because you see what happens when you start looking. The Bible says if a man desires a woman in his heart, he has already sinned. That does not mean he takes a casual look, say, hey, oh, she's nice looking, and keep on moving. No, this is when someone takes the time to look at her, get a real good look, examine, and before you start knowing, before you realize it, you're fantasizing. Amen? We'll keep it PG-13, all right? Start fantasizing, thinking about what could be, how it could be. You start thinking about things, and before you know it, you find yourself in your mind engaging in activity that you should not be in. Amen? David began to fantasize. He stayed too long. He gazed too long. He lingered too long. He should have stopped at the moment when he realized, wait, what am I doing? He should have stopped. But instead, he stayed too long. And then, the third thing he did, he had an investigation. He started inquiring. And that's when we that David said to and inquired, start asking questions. Who's her? Who's she? Who, who, who's, who is this woman? Yeah, I can't see her. Oh, that honey over there. Tell me something. I didn't know what's up with her. You see, when he did that, it was the, it's displaying his motive, his motivation. What are you trying to do? That's why the service told him that this is the, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah. Think about what you're about to do. Think about what you're imagining. Think about, see, what we don't do when, we, when we're engaging in, 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 in a situation where we're leading to a sinful situation through a bad decision, we don't think about the consequences of said decision. We don't think about the consequences. What am I doing standing here thinking about this and, and, and not only thinking, now I'm, getting, I'm moving even closer because I'm starting to ask questions. I want to know more about it. I want to know more about her. I want to know more about it. I want to know more about them. And when we get to that point, we are being dragged in. The Bible says that when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. But it hooks you first. It's what's in you hooks you and pulls you towards that sin. And before you know it, you find yourself wrapped up in something that could potentially cause damage, not just to you, but later on, we find out damage to David's whole household. Amen? So, he said, to investigate. He inquired. And then the sin of adultery. Now, let me say this. I've been reading some uh, of his commentaries about this, and some suggested that Bathsheba had to have some involvement in this, that she knew what she was doing. But if you read the text, particularly when Nathan came and approached David about his sin. The Bible says that she was not a participant, a willful participant, but it says that she was a victim just as much as Uriah was. So it suggests because the Bible says, and some of your, and some of your translation says that he took her. I want you to think about that. He took, she, he was the king. She could not tell him no. You hear what I'm saying? She did not say, no, King, don't do this because I'm married. Don't do this, King. You know, you know who, who you know my daddy, you know my husband. No, don't no. As the king, he took what he wanted. Let me just jump. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump a little ahead right now. One of the things that David had a problem with is that he abused his power. David abused his authority as king. Now, if I could get just a little political, just a little bit. One of the reasons why we're in such a disarray in our country right now is because of abuse of power. Someone given a position of title or responsibility that's supposed to be governing based on the needs of the country, not based on their own need. And because that person, and you know who I'm talking about, because that person refuses to look at the world and, and outside of himself, he sees the world as that's supposed to feed him, attend to him, serve him. And everyone else is just a, a pawn in his, in his life, in his game called life. 
And so now we're suffering the vision. We're suffering uh, 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 where people die. And, and we, we're going through a, a virus that just is continuing because, because we have nobody at, at, the, at the head of the, the, the leadership steering the ship where we need to go. Because he's too narcissistic. Think about himself. David fell into that category for a minute. Now remember, he was a man after God's, God's own heart. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful that even in my worst times, that God doesn't categorize me based on what I did or how messed up I was. You see, he could have said, instead of saying that David was a man after my own heart, that David was one who's going to do everything I told him, he could have said, David the adulterer, David the murderer, because that's what he did. He sent Uriah to the front line so he could die. He did not call him those things. He said, he's the apple of my eye. Aren't you glad that God's grace does not remember all the things you did? Aren't you glad that God takes your sin and places them in the sea of forgetfulness? Aren't you glad that God takes your sin and places them as far as east is from the west? Aren't you glad that he says, I cast them behind my back and remember them no more? Because if we always brought our sin back up, like some people like to do, and some, you know, some people like to remind you how messed up you were, how messed up you are, how messed up you used to do things, remember? They want to always remind you of what you did. But God's grace, God's grace, God's grace says, I will continue to remember who I'm calling you to be. I selected you for a purpose, and I bring you to a certain place. You're not what you were. No, you're not there yet. But I have a plan to bring you to the place that I have selected you for. So thank God that he doesn't hold everything against you. Thank God that the blood of Jesus washes free from our sin and decay. Thank God that he, that he consistently forgives and cleanses us on a daily basis. Thank God we have a way to come in and get ourselves right by confessing our sins. He faithful and just forgive us and cleanse us from all our racism. Aren't you glad that he doesn't hold, all, hold us accountable to every wrong that we've done in our past? David had the sin of adultery, but God didn't call him an adulterer. Amen? He did it. David gave it into his lust and lay with Bathsheba, the wife of one of his most loyal warriors. Look what happened. And the results, she became impregnated with David's baby. He had another woman, a wife of one of his faithful warriors. Read the text in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He tried to send Uriah home. He tried to get him drunk. He tried to do everything to get him to go home with his wife. But he didn't do it. Why? Because you're more honorable than the king was. He knew his position. He said, I won't go. My, if the men are still laying out there in the field, how am I going to lay in my bed? Drink wine and be with my wife. I, I, no, no, I can't do that. He made a better decision than the king. Look at this. Step five. One bad decision after the next. I told you. After that, he tried to escape the accountability. Trying to get you right to sleep with his wife, it didn't work. See, God was not going to let him get away with this. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit. He's just dropping this in my, in my spirit right now. Listen, thank God he's going to let you get away with everything. Hallelujah. If he let you get away with everything, then he says, you know what? That means something. That must mean if he let you and I get away with everything that we thought we were big enough and bad enough to do, it must suggest to him that we don't belong to him. He must not consider us, consider us his child. Thank God the Holy Spirit troubles you when you make a bad decision. Thank God the Holy Spirit messes you up. You can't sleep at night sometimes. That's what's going on right now sometimes. You think it's because of the job, you're just tired, and you know, you've been worn out. No, no, no. It's because you haven't confessed that thing, honey. You have to confess that thing, my brother. God says confess it, and he'll cleanse you. He'll get, he'll get that off your back. Amen? Let's look at this. I, I'm, uh, I've got, the, I got six minutes left. Thank you. One bad decision after the next. Since that didn't work, I told you, he had Uriah killed by ordering him to be sent to the fiercest part of the battle. He told Joab 
send him to the fiercest part of battle, then fall back from him. Leave him out there to die. This is a man after God's own heart. I said all that to say this. No matter how close you get to God, no matter how well you may be right now, don't ever forget you're just a prayer away from falling. Don't ever forget that somehow you have arrived. As long as we're here on planet Earth, as long as we're here wrestling with our flesh, as long as we have the devil to contend with, as long as we have the world to deal with, as long as we have our own mind to deal with, and every now and then our own nature wants to step back up and start talking to us, we got to remember we are in a position where we, are, we, we, we can fall. Amen. That's why we must remain humble before the Lord because God says, I resist the proud. That's what happened with David. He got proud. He was having all these victories. People shouted his name. And David came to the point where I have to do what I want. I don't have to go to war. They do. I don't have to take, I, I, I don't have to just have one wife. I have anyone I want. That's what David thought. I told you it's abuse of power. Well, when we get to the place where we are, when we get to the place where we think that we have it all together because things have been going well for a period of time, watch out. Because the enemy loves it when we get complacent. We don't need to pray as much. I don't need to be on my post. I don't need to read my word. I don't need to, I don't need to worship. We're not in church. Come on now. Oh, you better have church in your house. You better have church in your bed, your bed, your basement, or your bedroom. You better find yourself a place in your car. You better find some place where you can go and get your church on. Because just because we're not together collectively here, that does not mean the devil's going to stop. The devil's going to take a break because COVID is pushing us away from the church. The devil's still hot and hot and fast, trying to do everything he can to keep us from doing the things we're supposed to do. And I'm noticing something. I know I got to get ready to close, but I'm noticing something. As much as we're doing and trying our best to make sure everybody has access to do the things they need to do, there's some folk falling off. Yes, you are. You're falling off. Why? It's not because the church doors are closed. The church is always open. The problem is that you have made some wrong decisions. And those decisions are leading you straight away from God. Y'all better hear me. That's all for free. All right? I ain't put that on my PowerPoint, so that don't cost you nothing. All right? So the consequence. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Wow. Remember the testimony? Remember we talked about what God said? This is my man. I chose him. He's going to do everything I tell him to do. He's the apple of my eye. He's a man that chiefs after my heart. Giant slayer. All that good stuff. Worshiper. This thing he did displeased the Lord. Just because you're standing behind a sacred desk on my, all the preachers in the house. Just because you have a title to your name. I'm talking about myself too. Doesn't matter how long you've been saved. We can do things that displease God. And we have to pay the consequence for that if we don't turn it over to God and start making better decisions. Look what he says here. Nathan said, first thing, Nathan said the sword would never depart from David's house. David, the results were that this was fulfilled in successive violent deaths of three of his sons, Ammon, Absalom, and, and, and Adonai, all died. And as a result of the one decision he made that could have stopped it all, he should have been on his post. If he was on his post, he would never have access. He would never seen. He would never investigated. He would never engaged. He would never stayed too long because he wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have been available to fall into that situation if he just went and did his job. Wow. That's heavy. That's heavy. Amen? I got to wrap this up. So I'm just going to tell you next week, we're going to finish up on the consequences. David's wives were taken from him. 
uh, this was fulfilled because Absalom was doing some crazy things and uh, he almost had his kingdom taken away from him. The baby that was born to Bathsheba would die. All is a consequence of David's bad decision. You ever hear me? One bad decision can lead to a lifetime of pain. But come back next week because we're going to talk about how God can redeem those bad decisions. And I told you last week we're going to talk about the worst decision ever made. We're going to briefly touch on that. Amen? And then we're going to give you ways in which God can help you and I to make wise decisions. That's the last class. So be with me next week. Come on back. This is our fired up Bible study. I don't know about you, but I'm fired up. Matter of fact, I'm sweating. I'm ready to get, I'm ready to do what God has me to do. And I'm excited about conveying this message. So tell somebody. Tell them about our Facebook page. Tell them about our YouTube. Tell them about our, our, our devotions. Tell them about our youth. Tell them, let them know that Shadow Baptist Church is still moving in the spirit of God. And we're not going to stop no time soon. Matter of fact, we didn't stop until God says so. I have a sneaky suspicion and we're not going to stop until it's time for us to go home. Amen? And I don't mean home to our houses. So God bless you. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, remember, 7 o'clock next week, we're going to be together. And I look forward to spending this time with you. I hope you look forward to spending this time with me. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.